I said, how about you? All right, all right. Let's everybody just settle down for a moment. Turn to the person one side or the other and say, wake up. <laughs> Go ahead and tell the other side now. Wake up. All right. If nobody beside you, turn around behind you in front of tap some other Hey, wake up. All right. It's a good day in the Lord. It's a great day to be alive, and Jesus Christ is coming back soon. I mean, what, what more could you want in life? Hallelujah. Are these lights up all the way? It just seems dim up here. Is they cranked up all the way? Well, I'm getting old. We've been in our series of messages having to do with the, uh, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Back to the Future. In fact, we've been in it for a couple, several months now. We've talked about the different aspects, the different top, uh, topics that cover the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the different things that will be happening during that time. I believe, I hope you do believe, after we've looked at all these different things, that we understand that Jesus Christ is coming back. And it's probably sooner than what most of us believe or think. I really believe, I believe it's sooner than what most people believe. I, I think that time is upon us. I think the prophecies have been laid out. And we're going to talk today about some comparisons as we celebrate, you know, this time of season that we're in which ultimately Christmas is all about the prophetic fulfillment of the first coming of Jesus Christ. It was prophesied for thousand plus years that there would be a Savior. He would come. He would be, become a, a man, the God-man. He would become a suffering lamb, the sacrifice for our sins. And all those prophecies by many prophets of the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis all the way into the actual happening, return, the first return of the, the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we call it the incarnation of Jesus Christ. All those prophecies were fulfilled. Excuse me. Maybe you don't understand that. That there was nothing that was prophesied about Jesus and his first coming that was not fulfilled. Excuse me. I don't think you're paying attention. This is no coincidence. This is... Multiple men spread out over periods of hundreds of years, separated by time and space, who prophesied different prophecies concerning the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that all came true. Not one prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus' first coming was not fulfilled. Even in his coming, during his presence on the earth, all the way up to his crucifixion, even while dying... He was chalking off all those Old Testament prophecies, one after the other, one after another. So if just logic dictates that if all those prophecies over all those hundreds of years by so many different prophets all came true, do we not believe that God is strong enough and true enough to his word that all those prophecies concerning his second coming will come true as well. I believe it. I, I'm, just, I'm just naive enough, I guess, to believe it. But I, you know, which I not only believe it, let me tell you something that may shock you a little bit. You may want to consider replacing me. I believe it so much so, I believe it could happen today. Well, at least the, that part about the blessed hope where he returns for the church in the air and he comes as a thief of the night with two in the field, one left, one left in the field, two in the bed, one left in the bed. You know, some folks missing church that Sunday morning. You know, that I, I, just, I just don't find any rational, logical excuse to believe the first part happened like it would happen according to prophecy and that the second part would not. I just don't have any, uh, there's no space for, for believing anything else. And what I want to do is we look at back to the future part 11 today. I want to compare the first coming and those prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus with the second coming and the prophecies concerning the second coming. In fact, it's, it's, it's a message of comparison and contrast. First, dealing with the incarnation. That's when Jesus, God's son, becomes a man, born of a virgin, and comes to the planet. Prophecies fill the Old Testament concerning that. Then the second coming, not the incarnation, but the coronation, where he is crowned before the whole world, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and they see him in all his glory. Because I think it's, it's, it's good to take that event and the event that's coming and hold them side by side, and I think it will also probably impress upon you 
the clear realization that if this happened, you can mark it down, this will happen. If God said this would happen, and God said this would happen, and this did happen, you can mark it down, this other, this coronation event will come as well. So I want to look at several things concerning comparison today, how they compare, but also look at the contrast in each one of these events. So are you ready? Say amen. Amen. Let's look at the comparisons to begin with in Scripture concerning both the coronation, uh, the incarnation and the coronation of Jesus Christ. It's important to understand that prophets of the Word of God speak about both of these events. In fact, there are eight prophecies for every one prophecy concerning the second coming. In other words, for every one prophecy given, there's eight more given concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. If prophecy one concerning the first coming over here, mark it down, there's eight others talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The accuracy of these prophecies has been so unique and so specific uh, that it's beyond incredible to realize just how they could give something so unique and so specific and how it would be fulfilled. I mean, there's so many things about the first coming of Jesus that were prophesied concerning his birth, where he'd be born, uh, situations surrounding his birth. Uh, on and on, it, it just goes. And In fact, the prophets speak of Jesus Christ as being human as well as being divine, as well king over men and a king over creation as well as a man among men. In fact, let's look at some of what some of the prophets had to say in regard to Jesus Christ and who it would be. Isaiah tells us that he would be born of a virgin in chapter 7, verse 14. It goes on to say in in, in Isaiah that he would be despised, he would be forsaken, he would be stricken, he would be pierced through, he would be crushed, he would be chastened, he would be scourged, he would be oppressed, and he would be afflicted. All those things, 800 years before Christ, were said about Christ. Isaiah also tells us some other things regarding the Messiah. It says that that he will be called wonderful, he'll be called counselor, He talks about him coming as the one who would be mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. The increase of his government, you know, it it talks about how he would, would, that the government would rest upon his shoulders, that he would be called not just Jesus, his name, Lord Jesus, Messiah, but he literally would be considered, you know, the Emmanuel. What is that? God with us is the literal uh, terminology for Emmanuel. The angels told Mary and Joseph, you will name him Jesus. And later said, but he will be called Emmanuel. Well, why would Jesus be called Emmanuel? Because Jesus is God with us. I don't think it's possible to embrace the understanding and the full understanding of what it means to to believe in Jesus and to understand the gospel without realizing that Jesus is not only God, he's also man, he's man and he's God. And just as much as he's man, he's just as much as God. So we understand that when when Isaiah speaks of him in these terms, not only is he the man, he suffers, he's afflicted, he's the lamb that would be offered for our sins, but also he's the king of glory, and he he was God himself and God with us. It's repeated in Matthew 1.23 when he says he'll be called Emmanuel. Daniel also speaks of him. He talks about, calls him as one like the son of man in Daniel chapter 7. Micah, the prophet, talked about where the Lord Jesus would be born and he promises to Bethlehem that from you, Bethlehem, will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago and from days of eternity. What's he telling us? That Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. That's where that he, he would be born. But not, then there's this kind of awkward looking thing, but not only would he be the ruler of Israel, his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. In other words, this baby's gonna be born hey, this is not his first time to see the light of day. He is the light, all right? That he's, 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 he is an eternal being. He is the son of God. He is from eternity past to the present to Bethlehem and on into the eons and decades to come down the line that will come. So Micah prophesies specifically his place of birth, Bethlehem. It's interesting to note that he wasn't born in Houston. That would have failed the prophecy, would it not? Or that he wasn't born in Syria and Samaria or somewhere else, or even Jerusalem, only eight, ten miles away. He's born in Bethlehem. Micah speaks of Zephaniah, the prophet, tells the people that when the king comes, he'll be the king of Israel. He'll be the Lord in their midst. Zechariah tells us that he'll be just. 
and he will be endowed with salvation and that when he reigns, every family on the earth will be able to go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts in, Isaiah, in, in, in Zechariah chapter 14. And he said that this coming king would be man and God, God and man. Now all these guys were born many years apart. And they're all hearing from God in different places at different times. And they're all speaking different elements and different parts of the Messiah and how he'd come, where he'd be born, what he'd be called, what he would do, how he would suffer. All those prophecies were fulfilled. Now, I do not believe that any of these guys fully comprehended the full nature of Jesus about whom they prophesied. I think they had the insight as the Holy Spirit gave it to them. They spoke as the Holy Spirit spoke through them and to them, and they wrote as the Holy Spirit wrote through them. But Peter tells us, the prophets who prophesied the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person of time that the Spirit of Christ, that is Messiah within them, was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. They didn't understand how there could be a suffering Savior and a glorious Messiah. They didn't comprehend all those things that we now clearly see. They were prophesying by the power of God's presence within them as he spoke to them about things they didn't clearly understand. I don't even believe that the disciples, even though they had this fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies in front of them in Jesus Christ, I don't think they fully understand all the things that they were going to write about in the New Testament concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even as they're standing there after being with Jesus for three years, the crucifixion's taken place, the resurrection's happened, they've seen Jesus in his full glory, in his glorified body, and as he is being ascended into heaven, remember what you know, the angel said, he's going to come again in like manner. Did they understand all that? I don't think so. If you look back in John 14, 15, 16, you see those last hours where Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the upper room. And he tells them even then, you know, you don't know everything. I, I don't have time to tell you everything. I've been with you a while, but I have many things to say to you still, but not to worry. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to make these things clear to you, and he's going to speak to you about these things and about my coming. He made it very clear to them. You don't have it all yet, but I'm going to get it to you. Don't worry about it. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. It's the same way that the prophets of old received it. The Holy Spirit spoke to them. And now the prophets of the New Testament, the apostles, begin to lay out in Scripture the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what would be involved in the, in the process of them sharing truth about the Lord's return, such as John with the whole of the book of Revelation. Now, here's what's interesting in comparison here. Number two is this. The majority of the religious crowd of the day knew about it but ignored it. I believe it's the same today. There's many, many people who know about the Lord's return, who can tell you what the Bible has to say. Many preachers, many Bible teachers, many Sunday school teachers, cell group leaders who can tell you a lot of what the Bible has to say about the Lord's return, but they completely ignore it. They're just ignorant of it. Now, I don't believe everybody, you think about Zacharias and Simeon who knew and believed that he would see the day. I mean, he was looking for Messiah. Remember when Jesus was taken up to the temple to be dedicated there before the Lord, that Simeon saw him? He, he, he'd been expecting. He, I can die now. I've seen what, I, what I've been longing to see. In Matthew 2, remember in regard to the birth of Jesus, how that in Matthew 2 the wise men, they go up to Jerusalem because they followed his star as far as Jerusalem. And so they stop at Jerusalem, and understandably, because they believe that this Jesus who was to be born would be king. So where do the kings reign in Israel? They reign in Jerusalem. So they stop in Jerusalem inquiring about the whereabouts of the Lord Jesus Christ. Harry says, I think I've heard something about that. Let me get the Baptists together. Let me get the Pharisees together. Let me get the religious people together. Let me call the denominational leaders in. And they all say, yeah, you know, we read those prophecies, you know, of Isaiah and Daniel and Micah and Zechariah and Zephaniah. In fact, one of them speaks uniquely that out of Bethlehem would come the Savior. Ah, oh, Bethlehem it is. 
punch those coordinates into our smoke farms and head for Bethlehem. Well, on their way, obviously, the, the sign of the Lord's glory shows and, and leads them all the way right directly to the manger, and there they find Messiah. It says Micah prophesied that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Now, we know in scriptures that it won't be far from that spot. You know, Bethlehem is very close in, in, in respect to mileage from, you know, it's, it's closer to Jerusalem than his spring is to downtown Houston, all right? Bethlehem is to Jerusalem. So probably half the distance or less. It's not too far for Jesus is going to come back to Jerusalem and reign. But you realize that what astounds me about the whole story was that as the wise men leave Jerusalem on their way to Bethlehem, that all those Pharisees and scribes and lawyers weren't in tow with them. Hey, wait for us, we're coming. You've seen the sign, you've seen the revelation that he's coming. You know he's, hey, he's, he should be born. We're with you, buddy, come on, wait for us. I've got to get my bags packed. But not so, any more so today. Then you people, you see people with an expectation or an excitement about the Lord's return. In fact, today people are kind of hoping he doesn't return. You might be saying, you know, well, let me get my Christmas bonus first. Christmas bonus ain't going to do you any good in heaven. All right? Well, you know, like one girl told me, I just need to get married first. But hey, the, the groom is coming. Amen. And, and it's going to be a lot better than the one you're waiting for around here. No amens, please. <laughs> But, there, you know, there's this expectation that's just absent that ought to be present. And the Bible, even Jesus, in his own words in Matthew 24, he made the statement regarding that, you know, that there would be this... Um, would you punch the next page for me, please, somehow? In Matthew, listen to this verse. In Matthew 24, verses 42 through 47, can you roll to the next page for me now, please? For this reason, you be ready to. For the Son of Man is coming... At an hour that you do not think he will. Now, how accurate is that to the day that we live in? Not a one a person in this room thinks he's going to come back this hour. You don't have to raise your hand and try to prove me wrong. You may be one of the few. But I would say 99.98. Don't believe he's coming back this hour. So that's what it's going to be. Who then is that faithful and sensible servant, the slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that I will put him in charge of all the possessions. In other words, the Lord's saying, there doesn't seem to be anybody with an expectation that I'm going to return when I return. It was the same as it was in Jerusalem the time he came the first time, is it not? Men's hearts are hardened in the day and the age that we live in. The third comparison is this. The known world was under dominion of one man that thought he was God. And so will it be in the last days, all right? Luke talks about there was a decree sent forth from Caesar Augustus. Remember, he thinks he's God. He's the Roman ruler. Rome rules the world. Caesar rules Rome. And so he wants to count everybody on the planet, the inhabited earth, and then he wants to tax them. Same thing we're going to see in the end of times with the Antichrist who declares himself to be God. Now we know and understand that there should be an expectation upon all of us that Jesus Christ is coming very soon. Now I don't mean the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. We made it very clear throughout these 10 sermons that there's two events in regard to the end times. All right, one of the events is the, bl the blessed hope where the Lord appears in the air, the thief in the night experience, when the saints of God are caught up in the air, the dead in Christ rise first, and those that are alive in Christ go with him. Boom, we're out of here. Mass chaos sets out on the globe. Can you imagine the, the crisis that takes place globally at this point? In this process, the Middle East Treaty is signed by a very global charismatic leader who we refer to as the man of sin, the son of destruction, the Antichrist. He steps onto the scene in this end time Drama when things are so critical in the world offers a peace that turns out to be no peace at all. It's a pseudo peace. It's a lie. He allows the temple to be reconstructed and three and a half years into this seven year peace treaty, he goes in like Caesar, declares himself in this, remember it's like this, Daniel called it like a revived Roman empire, those 10 nations of clay and iron that we talked about in Daniel's vision. It's like a revived Roman empire. You know, even Hitler saw himself as Caesar over a revived Roman Empire. It's a little precursor where Satan tried to make his move, but it's not yet time. This guy rises on the scene. He's the Antichrist in the last days. And the Bible refers to him in 2 Thessalonians. He says, and he comes 
and causes the small and the great and the rich and poor and free men and slaves to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead and he provides that no one should be able to do anything, buy or sell except the one who has this mark. Either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number of the, uh, is that of a man. His number is 666. What's he saying? There's going to be a man who rises at the end of times in those last three and a half years before the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ who declares himself to be God over the world, requires his census to be taken, requires everybody to be marked and pay him the taxes due. So we see the same kind of thing happens at the second coming. In fact, Revelation talks about this. In the book of Revelation, it says he causes all, small, rich, and poor. So you have, you have this, this dual thing of 2 Thessalonians. He's a God. And then you have the Revelation experience. Number four, there was a fiery sign that accompanied Christ at his coming. And that's his first coming as a child, a babe. That's his second coming. In Matthew 2, it says, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, star here has been written about for thousands of years, people trying to diagnose and to understand what this star was. I do not believe it's a star or an arrangement of stars in the skies. You know, people say, well, the wise men, they were astronomers. Some say, no, they were astrologers. Uh, I will tell you, the wise men, they were from Persia. Most likely, if you follow the whole scenario and why they would even seek Messiah is, they were most likely descendants of Daniel, children of Israel, still in captivity in Israel. They were men from the east who had been taken, uh, their parents had, or their grandparents had been taken from Israel in the, in the, in, when the Persians came in, the Medes and the Persians, and took over Israel. These men were taken back. Out of that group came men like Daniel, became great leaders in the nation. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, raised to places of great authority because of their faith and their commitment to God. They were recognized next to the king in some of these situations. They most likely were Hebrews by, as descendants of Hebrews. They studied the scriptures. They stayed true to the word of God. Nothing could deter them. Look at Daniel's testimony, Shadrach and Meshach's and Abednego's testimony. Against the threat of their lives, through lion or fire, they stayed true to the word of God. And now they come on the scene, I believe, following the prophecies, and they see a sign. What is this sign? I believe it's a star, but not like we know as a star, nor it is a constellation, nor is it Halley's Comet. There's no way on earth a comet could lead these guys for months on end, this 800-plus mile journey to get to Jerusalem, lead them right to the city, and then take them all the way to Bethlehem. And then this comet stand over a manger in Bethlehem. It just torched the whole place. It had to be something unique. And the Bible talks about this something unique. The Bible mentions this fiery sign and it calls it the glory of God. The Bible mentions a fiery sign where Moses is standing and communicates with God who's this fiery sign in the bush that the bush is not consumed. Or whether it's the dedication of Solomon at the temple when the glory of God is manifest, this fiery, wonderful sign comes, drives everybody out of the temple because of the presence and the holiness of God. I believe it's the same sign that accompanied the children of Israel as they made their way out of Egypt across the wilderness, headed 40 years, led by a cloud by day and a fire by night. When the scriptures talk about clouds, Jesus appearing in clouds is not talking about zero cumulus stratus, whatever kind of cloud. It's talking about the glory of God, that same glory that accompanied the children of Israel. It was the presence, the glory, the majesty, the power of God being manifest. So here's these men of Persia. They're following what they know this fiery sign is from the Old Testament. And they're following it all the way up to where they ultimately discover the Lord Jesus Christ. But Matthew 24 says, Jesus is speaking, for this reason, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is that faithful servant we're going to talk about in Matthew 24? But he gets down to verse 27. But as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He said, it's going to appear when I appear over the planet, coming in majesty. It's going to appear like lightning. 
this manifest power, this manifest beauty, this manifest glory of God, I believe around the globe, because every eye will see this. Every eye is going to witness this. When the Son of Man comes shining from the east to the west, so shall the Son of Man be. Remember the story of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. It said there were shepherds in the same country, abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord, watch this word, shone, lighted around them. And they were freaked out. Joram's translation. They were so afraid. I don't know, I've been afraid before. I don't know if I've been so afraid. So afraid it hurts. <laughs> Is that sore afraid? They were so afraid. Why? Because this majesty, this manifestation of light, these angels accompanying the glory of the Lord shone around about them. It's the same glory, the same power, the same majesty. Listen, the Bible talks about, I mentioned this verse a little bit later on, 1 Peter 5, when the chief shepherd shall appear. You know, when he appears, then you will receive an unfading crown of glory. That God is going to place upon your head this wreath of his glory, this wreath of his master. The first time he comes is, the, is, 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 is baby Jesus. They come to see Jesus. They're just shepherds coming to see Jesus. But soon Jesus is going to come to see us all. But he's coming as the great shepherd of all men. Imagine these humble men in the very presence of God and the glory of God is seen and the angel of God speaks to them in humility. They said, come, let us go also. What was the witness? It was the glory and the majesty of God. We're going to see that in the end of times like at no other time in history probably. The fifth comparison is they were sought by wise men to recognize him as the king of kings. And the second coming of Christ, the wise will really receive their king. Matthew 21, 2, 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east. Now again, these wise men, if you follow, it's the word magoi in, in the Greek language. We use the word magi today. And by the way, there's no place where it says there were three. We, three kings. It doesn't say that. And it's probably more than three. They, they were, the word Magoi refers to in Persian history is a ruling class. They literally, they literally were called the king makers in Israel. I believe they were this class of Hebrews, people who have been faithful to God. That's my personal opinion. They said, we want to know where he is and we've come to find him because ultimately they can't make him king. He already is king. God's the only king maker. They come and they bear gifts before this king. At the second coming, when Jesus comes for the wise, his children, we will cast our crowns at his feet. We will honor him. And the nations will honor him as king of kings and lord of lords. So if you consider yourself to be really smart, it would be best to cast your life down before the king today and be the wise person he calls you to be. The sixth comparison is this. Angels announce both events. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men were all spoken to, warned by, witnessed to by angels, these messengers from heaven. His second coming will be with the trump and the voice of an archangel. In other words, this trump of God sounds, and this is the glorious appearing when he comes and it sounds and the earth sees this blast of glorious glory from God that's manifest around the planet. There's going to be this voice of the archangel. You say, what's it say? I don't know. But I bet I hear it, <laughs> and I bet everybody else hears it when this voice speaks. I don't. Maybe it's an introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the glorious King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And the voice speaks, and there's the welcome of the glory of God onto the planet. The seventh comparison is this. He was sought out to be destroyed by enemies at both events. In Matthew chapter 2, Herod wanted to slaughter the little innocent babies, and he did. The parallel of that is also when Moses was sought out to be killed and destroyed. Those Hebrew children all lost their lives. Moses was put into the, the, to the river in, in, a, in a basket. At the end of time, Megiddo, the world armies are gathered together and there's such chaos that God comes in his glory and defeats the enemy. The Bible says that when he comes, Antichrist is there and he's mounted his forces and he's rallied his troops from around the world. The Bible says that when Jesus appears with us in the heavens over Megiddo, 
over that valley. That out of the mouth of Jesus will go forth a two-edged sword. What is that? That's the word of God. The Bible says, in other words, Jesus will speak and Satan will be destroyed, his voice. At least the Antichrist. Satan is put into a pit. And such chaos at the word of God being spoken by the living word of God, such chaos ensues that there's this madness where people fall on each other's swords and destroy one another. Now, those are some of the comparisons, but there are also some, some contrasts. We talked about how in the actual event with the contrast in the, the first coming, how the, there were those who knew about it. Few knew of the actual event, though, and the place of his first coming. But this next event, it's going to be such a big deal, everybody's going to know about it. The Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky and with great power and glory. And he will send forth his angels and a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the end of the sky to the other, another whole earth. Everybody's going to, every tribe, every nation, every person alive on the planet will see him. Remember, the world's in an unbelieving state of chaos. This is the end of the tribulation. Millions upon billions of people have died, and they still will not believe. And it says they will mourn when they see him. Mourn for their failures, mourn for their ignorance, mourn because they rejected the Lord. They'll mourn. Revelation put it this way in chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds. There's that glory of God again. And every eye shall see him, and they which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. What an event. What a day. Now, just as much, catch this with me. Don't miss this. Just as much as I believe in little baby Jesus lying in a manger over here, you know. I believe that story. I believe this story as well that everybody's going to see. And they're going to see in such manifest glory. They're going to see Jesus in all his power, in all his deity, in all his majesty. It's going to blow their minds, for lack of better terminology. Another contrast is this. He was sought out by the shepherds as the child, but the second coming, he's the chief shepherd coming for his children. He comes now as the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the chief, chief shepherd. There he stands in Luke chapter 2. We see the story of the angel. We read it a while ago, but also we talked about in 1 Peter 5, 4, where he comes. He comes as the chief shepherd for his children and to crown them with his glory. The next comparison is this. The first coming saw the slaughter of innocent children and babies, the pursuit of an innocent Christ trying to destroy him. The second coming, it's the other way around. He's judging the unrighteous. First coming... They sought to judge the righteous, to destroy the innocent, to slaughter the children and the babies surrounding the birth. The second coming, it will not be like that. The second coming, it's all those unrighteous and perverted in heart who are going to pay the price. For centuries, mankind has hated Christianity. For centuries, men have destroyed Christians. For centuries, they've tried to burn their Bibles. For ages, they've tried to stamp out every vestige of God and, and, and the Scriptures and all that God stands for. Even today, two-thirds of the world, churches and Christians still are in countries where they're persecuted, where it costs them their lives and sacrifice on a great deal and suffer a great deal just to love Jesus and to worship Jesus. Whole churches meet in secret in the woods and underground just to find places to openly worship God. We don't see that because we're so blessed in our nation. We have such freedom. But there are parts of the world where that is not experienced. And for centuries, there have been those who are demonized by Satan himself who seek to destroy any part, any parcel, any bit of godliness and of Jesus. But the day's coming when all those unjust and all those unrighteous and all those murderers and all those who stole from and took from and destroyed the lives of so many pure believers, they're going to have to pay the price. It's not going to go undone. It's a day of justice and a day of judgment on the unrighteous. The next contrast, this is the fourth. He came he was suffering, the suffering servant, born in the lowliest means in a stable. But the second coming, he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. 
Isaiah prophesied this in prophecy. The New Testament is filled from one end of the other to the other end about his lordship, about his headship, about his kingship. And the day will come when he lights up the skies and his presence is known and he puts his foot down the Mount of Olives and takes his seat in Jerusalem as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The whole world is going to see it. They're all going to witness it and they're going to realize he truly is the King of Kings. Every person who ever thought in his life, well, I'm just too smart for that. I don't believe all that mumbo jumbo in the Bible because my intellect far outweighs the ignorance of what those Christians believe. They're going to see in that moment when the sky is lit up and the che- Jesus is made manifest and his presence is so obvious that he is king of kings, they're going to realize their ignorance and their stupidity in that instance. It's undeniable at this point. Those who say, well, I'm too big, I'm too tough, I'm too rough, I don't need God, I don't need anybody else, I'm my own man, I determine my own destiny. They're going to see how weak, they're going to stand there in embarrassment, they're going to stand there in absolute shame at their ignorance when they see the undeniable evidence that he is all that strength is, he is all that might is, he is all that power is, he is all that wisdom is. The King of kings, the Lord of glory. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. You ought to wake up. I, I don't say you can just sit there like that. Oh, you got ice cubes in your pockets? Wake up, Jesus is coming. And every eye is going to see it without any hesitation. Nobody's going to say, well, I'm not really sure. No, they're going to be doing this. You are Lord. Nobody's going to have to hold a flaming sword to their neck. They're going to realize their ignorance in this moment. They're going to see the obvious that God has made obvious to so many of you already. He's Lord. He's everything that life is. He's everything that God intended. He, 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 is, he is God and holy God and should be worshipped in the beauty of holiness that he is God. The last contrast, although there's probably more, would be this. The first coming ended with him going up. The second with his coming down. Remember after the resurrection? 40 days, been with the disciples. They're gathered there in Galilee. And all of a sudden, as Jesus speaks to them, gives them those final marching orders, make disciples of all nations. He starts to ascend into these clouds to the glory of God. And they're in shock and awe, watching him up. And the angel of the Lord, what was his reference? Hey, guys, this same Jesus, not an angel, not another representative, not a mirage, not a pipe dream, this same Jesus is going to come again in like manner. Or is he going to come out of those clouds of glory? Just as he went into those clouds of glory, he comes out. So catch this. Don't miss this. The king came. How many believe that? How many believe the king came? Amen. I believe the king's coming. The king's coming. Unless we didn't realize the emphasis in scripture, if we take them all one by one, side by side, first promise, coming promise is given to us. Look at all these scriptures. Oops, there's eight times more of those scriptures telling us he's coming again. He's coming again. It's like the old songwriter said, not back, I guess it was in the 70s when Andre Crouch wrote, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. It won't be as long as some of you think. I hope it's sooner than I think. Amen? I, and I'm, just, I'm not just saying that because I know I've got to pay my taxes next year. <laughs> I want to get out of some problem coming up in my life. Or I don't want to get old and die. I believe Jesus is coming soon. And if I truly believe that, you know, then we have to move it from just theory into practice. And too often it's in theory, but it's not in practice. Oh, brother, I believe that, but there's no holiness in your life now. There's no, there's no witnessing now. There's no study of scripture now. There's no, there's no coming to church now. There's no, there's no reaching a lost world now. There's no living for Christ now. If none of those things are present in your life, then you have this theory in your head, Jesus is coming in. But it's got to go beyond theory to faith. And faith, if I truly believe it, well, the apostle put it this way. What manner of man, what manner of woman should you be? 
in all your holy living if you believe Christ is coming again. If I truly believe it, it's going to, kiss me, it's going to affect the way I think. It's going to affect the way I live. It's going to affect the way I speak. Because at any instance, mid-sentence of whatever I might be saying, you'd be sure Jesus is going to come back. And I'm going to say, oh! I hope you didn't hear that. He hears it before he gets here. We need to live our life in the presence of Jesus, but in the realization that he's coming and he's coming soon. I'm excited about that. I believe that we ought to be excited about it. I, ought to believe, I believe we should be so excited. You know, every once in a while we're driving down the freeway, we're looking up. You know, just go outside the house every once in a while and check out things. See if the sky is lighting up, you know. For us, it'll manifest as the thief in the night. When this other happens, we'll be looking from above, coming down to witness the world's reaction to the presence of Jesus. This is a lost subject in the church today, unfortunately. That's why the Bible says, because iniquity will abound in the end times, the love of many will wax cold. The more we open ourselves up to the degradation of this world and the secular system that we live in, the more we buy into what the world has to offer, the less sensitive we become, the harder heart we have in our life. So I need to examine myself to see if I'm allowing pollution to take place in my life, if I'm allowing a hardening to take place and give everything back to Jesus. We give invitations every week because I need one every week. I don't know about you. We have altar calls because I'm always needing one. I don't wait till Sunday. <laughs> I have one right here in my heart I can go to. But there are times when I need to come on Sunday and just get my heart right with God. We have altar calls for people who may be in our service who've never really given their life to Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. You say, what's that mean, Pastor? It means that you're no longer following yourself. You're going to start following Jesus. That's simply put. With a heart, a man believes. What's that mean? My heart is where my, is where my actions are. So if I believe, I'm following Jesus. That's what it means. No longer you're following your whims, your, your will, your purpose, your destiny. You don't know God's will and purpose for your life. You love Jesus. You believe he sacrificed himself for your sins. You've accepted his free gift. That, hey, you took my place. I thank you for that. And now you followed him as your Lord and Savior. Don't be those we talk about in scriptures that refer to as the apostates. People have a pretend religion. They have a pretend faith. Who just kind of, when it's acceptable, they, they, they do Jesus stuff. But when nobody else is around, when they do what, what they want to do, they just forget Jesus completely. No heart commitment. Give your life to Christ today if you've never done that. And if you're here as a Christian, thank God for 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because I know as well as you, there are times in this world when I just get dirty when I make bad decisions and say stupid stuff and do wrong things, and I need to come back to the cross. And thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand before the Lord today, and let's just get our hearts humble before him. This morning, you knew you need to make a decision for Christ. What would stop you from just being obedient to the Lord?